I want to take you a, a step or two into the future this morning. I don't know, five years, ten years. And the Grants Pass Seventh-day Adventist Church maybe will join with Merlin Church as well. And we're out here in the mountains and the hills awaiting the Lord's return. Probation is closed. And we're experiencing a time known as the time of Jacob's trouble. People are in groups and mobs throughout the world and throughout the Satan's army. And they have license, legal license, for extermination of Seventh-day Adventists. On sight, sort of like buying a deer tag. It's not going to be easy. But I was just wondering what you think that the Grants Pass and the Merlin, is it Upper, upper Valley or North Valley? North Valley Church is what we're concerned about. We're worried about, um, well, we can't go to the mall. Uh, we're going to miss our TV program. Are we worried about lack of food or losing our life? What do you think we're worried about? We're worried about that every sin has not been repented of and that through some fault in ourselves we won't be ready when Jesus comes in the East. Little do we know we're sealed. We made a decision. But you know, we look back into our lives and we see things that we wished had never happened or decisions that we had never made. Amen. And we decide we're worried. How am I ever going to make it? And things that we can do today, brothers and sisters, will help us to be ready for that time, for it'll be a very serious time. You can read about this in Great Controversy 619 and 620. And while they are worried, it says about Grants Pass Seventh-day Adventist churches, while they are worried, They can bring nothing to remembrance that will crush them and discourage them and cause them to lose hope. You know why they can't bring anything to remembrance? You know why we can't? Is because we've done our homework beginning today, last night. For we have made it right with each other and right with God. And that is the work that we're called upon to do in this old world. This is the work that we're called upon to do today before there's no longer any opportunity to do it later. This is something that we need to do as Seventh-day Adventists. We need to take responsibility for acts that have caused others pain. And we need to forgive those who have caused us pain. And then together, take it to God. And He will perform things that we think are absolutely impossible. What I'm suggesting, what I'm urging, what I'm pounding the desk over, is that I want all of us to take a journey of healing. A journey down a path that's not easy. 
but a journey that will result in the healing of our lives and prepare us for the soon coming of Jesus like we talked about last night. You say, now, wait a minute, Jerry. You know, I've, I've done some things. I don't think I can ever have it repaired. I mean, I've been brutal, or I have been treated brutally, and I'm supposed to forgive them? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Forgiveness and granting forgiveness is the message of this hour. We are in preparation. We are in the last days of the days of atonement. Afflicting our soul, including making it right with each other and getting right with God. But you say some of it is impossible. Ah, I'm glad you said that. For nothing is what? Impossible, impossible with God. We all know that, but in our experience, we say, well, no, wait a minute. I, I just can't get that radical to think that God or somebody could forgive me for what I've done. But let me read to you from volume five, the testimonies, page 343, and I want you to hear what it says about impossibilities. If you have engaged in this work of bruising and condemning and have not heartily repented, then light, peace, and joy will not come into your souls. I'm going to stop there just a minute. If we have bruised and condemned others or criticized or accused or some such thing, imagine coming to church and have no light no peace and no joy. Wouldn't that be a wild church service? No joy, no peace, and no light. We come there because we're members of a social club called the Seventh-day Adventist once a week meeting. But brothers and sisters, he wants us to take a step higher. And he wants us to have light, peace, and joy in our lives and in our services. But I just have too many impossibilities. Okay. Now listen, and they're going to record it too, so. And I'd like for you to read it when you get home. This is outside reading for this class. Outside Reading, Volume 5, page 343. And when you have done all on your part, you may ask the Lord to do that which is impossible for you to do. Heal the wounds that you have made. You can't do it. But if you begin this journey... this journey of healing, you may then ask the Lord to do that which is impossible for you to do, and that's heal the pain that you've caused. And if he'll heal the pain in the others, <clears throat> he will heal the pain in your heart as well if you've been hurt. And so there's a joyous reunion here potential, an evangelistic service that gathers those in who have been hurt because me as a member of the Grants Pass Seventh-day Adventist Church is saying to you who no longer attend here, I have been delegated by God to say I'm sorry. And would you please come back and would you forgive me?
Well, no. I just can't do that because they did some things and they're out there now. They've made their bed. Let them sleep in it. You probably never heard that. Let them stay in it. Let them sleep in it. But you see, when we take responsibility for the pain that we have caused, we have made them the expert on their feelings. And we can say, I didn't intend so. I don't know a whole lot about it. But I'm taking responsibility for causing your pain. And would you please forgive me? Or I can say, listen, we need to take a stand here. You're in the wrong. You're still in the wrong. And I justify my position. And no reconciliation can take place. None at all when we justify when we have hurt someone else. Now there's two other things that are impossible that the Lord lists here. The first one is that he can help you heal the wounds that you have made and also reciprocally you may be healed from the wounds that you have experienced. The second one is he will forgive you. That's something that's impossible for us to do. But he in heaven will forgive you. And if he will forgive you, do you think that we could venture into the faith realm by saying, I'll forgive myself. If he will forgive you, can I forgive myself? Amen. May God grant it. And finally, he will blot out your transgressions. Amen. The three things. He'll heal the wounds you have made. He will forgive you and blot out your transgressions. And you know what happens next? And I don't understand it, but God gets memory loss. I'll remember what? Your sin no more. If God can get memory loss, can we? Well, as I'm getting older, I have no problem. Here. <laughs> but if God can get memory loss, brothers and sisters, can we? Oh, yes. All of these impossibilities he's going to take care of. Now, what is your potential for witnessing for Christ? tell you a story out of the Bible. There were ten lepers. Can you imagine what it was like when they left home? They're hugging their children at the risk of disease transmission as it was understood then. They're going away into a hovel, into a leper colony, and they will never be back. They're going there to die. Imagine what the family separation would be like. And so they go, and the family just is in tears constantly. They arrive at the leper colony, and somebody, bless their heart, whoever it is, told them a rumor. They said that there's a person in Galilee that we heard could heal leprosy. Oh, can you imagine what little spring seed of hope might spring up if you heard such a rumor? And since you had no hope anyway, you would explore anything you could find. And so they did. They did it illegally they were legally required to stay in the leper colony. But here they go, they leave it, and they find out where this prophet is that supposedly can heal leprosy. And the more they talk about it, the more their faith increases until finally they find him, 
and he's coming out of a village and they begin yelling Lord Jesus have mercy on us and they yell again and they become obnoxious people start saying be quiet but they're hopeless and they're not going to hush up and Jesus hears, hears them and says go show yourself to the priest directs them back to the church church had problems back in those days you probably knew that but on the way what happened they were all healed now if you were one of the ten how anxious would you be to get back to your family I'm gone and I'm running and you know I really don't condemn those nine that did I want to be with my family again I'm healed not only is the disease gone but the parts that are missing have been restored it's like first John 1 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us and you know what that cleansing involves the loss of the disease of sin and the restoration of the parts lost we're in for a mighty mighty revival and there's miracles going to happen because if there ever was a time we are in the need of miracles today but one of these lepers said now wait a minute how did this happen anyway I have my fingers my feet are back my face is no longer scarred it looks like the skin of a young person how did this happen oh I know he did it and I really want to get back to my family but you know I'm going to go say thank you first and he did and here's the rest of the story probably a lot of you don't know the rest of the story what happened after this but in Ministry of Healing 134 it tells the rest of the story of the ten lepers who were cleansed one appreciated the gift and he was a stranger and a Samaritan for the sake of the one Christ healed the whole ten did you get that doesn't that just hit you in the chest powerfully for the sake of the one that came back to say thank you he healed the whole ten what is your potential just that being thankful to God being committed to God you have an unknown influence in this earth and potential of witnessing and causing healing to nine others and you don't even know it and nobody keeps score here on this earth but they do in heaven and I'd like to be in this group of lepers assuming they're all going to be in the kingdom when they find out what happened that God was working for them the whole time God was using the one to cause the other nine to bring in healing and you know what we need we need commitment at the hundred percent level we need thank yous at the hundred next time you sit down to your daily meal and you say thank you Lord you might just be amazed at the power of such a prayer but it's not just thank you for the food amen God is providing for every aspect of our life and for the sake of the one 
who said thank you. He healed the whole ten. Not only took the disease away, but he was an instrument trigger, a PowerPoint, as it were, that God, in his great abundant mercy, just waiting to do something special through somebody, won't somebody dedicate their lives at that level so that I can bless all of those around me. I am ready and willing to do it. When I was nine years old, we live in the Lentz District in Portland, Oregon. Wasn't very good then. Lived in an abandoned streetcar and we were migrant farm workers. We traveled all the way from Portland to Oklahoma and back home again and was on welfare in the winter time. <coughs> Down the street was a grocery store and there were times when we didn't have food in the house. Don't remember if this is one of those times or not, but I was a street kid. I knew how to get into stores, get what I wanted and get out and not pay for it at nine. I understand now they're training them earlier. I had my eye on a candy bar. This is a long time ago. Nobody here will remember this because it's so long ago. But candy bars were a nickel. Oh, I guess some of you do remember, okay. I took it and ate it on the way home. When I got home, my mother asked me a very penetrating question. Where did you get the candy bar? Now, I've heard stories about mothers. <laughs> Even then, I, like, it, they can see into your soul, you know. Or they can look forward and know what you're doing directly in back of them, like they had eyes in the back of their head. And I thought this was one of those things. But unbeknownst to me, right in the corner of my mouth was what? A piece of chocolate. Took me by the hand, and where do you suppose we went? Back down, and I didn't want to go to this grocery store again. It's not a place I wanted to go. She went down, and she paid the nickel. And I was assigned to work parts of two days putting stuff on the shelf and dusting with a great big brush, a squirrel tail brush, dust the shelf. And after the second day, the manager says, okay, Jerry, you can go home now. And my restitution was completed. But a question ar arises later in life, for me at least, what do we do about these things that we can't just pay a nickel? or work extra and make it right. Well, I want you to know the good news is that God has a plan to deal with the impossibilities. Amen. We're going to take a couple of references now that comment on some things that seem impossible. Steps to Christ 62. You know the book Steps to Christ? It's the one we hand out to others but we don't read ourselves. Steps to Christ 62, and here's the glorious good news from this. Christ's character stands in the place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. Amen. Accepted just as if you'd never sinned. Impossibilities all in this same great big pile right here in front of the pulpit all the big pile of bones and skeletons that we have accumulated over our lifespan, they're all right here included, and we're accepted as though we had never sinned. Amen. Ought to hear more amens, don't you think? Amen. That gives you special hope, doesn't it? Yes. Now this from Desire of Ages 25. 
in Christ, we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. Now these are concepts that just absolutely expand my mind. I, I have endured and gone through calculus class at college and university. But I can't get my mind around this. How could it be that if Adam, if he had gone straight through and never made a mistake, wouldn't he be closer than you and I are? Seems like it, doesn't it? Well, I got a little insight into it. I want to share it with you. My son, Jed, who's now 31 years old. When he was younger, he got in a little difficulty, and it was my job to apply some Irish discipline. And we sit down and talked about it. And he leaned over and he hugged me and he says, Dad, I'm sorry for what I did. And it dawned on me, brothers and sisters, that he was closer than if he had never made the mistake. He'd be outside playing in the mud with these I think they're called Tonka trucks, great big trucks. We afford to buy one or two of them. He now has bigger trucks. But if he was outside playing, we wouldn't be in the process of hugging and making it right and saying, I'm sorry, closer than if he had never fallen. Now, mind you, we don't want to keep making mistakes in order to generate more hugs with God, right? We, we've got plenty to qualify us already. We don't want to presume. But brothers and sisters, think of it. Through our horrible mistakes, we're going to be closer to God than if we had never fallen. Because we need Him. We need that mercy that never came out until sin came in. That aspect of God's grace that is incomprehensible. So there is blessings. There's fringe benefits, as Pastor referred to. There's fringe benefits to being a Christian. In that we have this, the only channel we can possibly get to having impossibilities dealt with as being a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Because when we witness to somebody else and they make a choice different than what we made, it restores the years the locust ate out of your life and mine. Seems impossible. Here's another impossibility. Here's Israel. They're worshiping idols and they're doing all kinds of sexual party time around these idols. And God told Jeremiah that Israel was a harlot in Jeremiah 2.20. It was literally true. Then there was a little revival came along in the person of Josiah. And God instructed his prophet Jeremiah in 3121 to say turn again O virgin Israel harlot to virgin now wait a minute that's impossible isn't it by the way will there be any harlots in heaven well it's kind of a trick question no practicing ones. These people are completely victorious. Right? Now with, with harlotry and prostitution, there's more than just a new life. There is physical and emotional damage. To where it creates a lifestyle for them, they have to have dependencies, alcohol and drugs, in order to keep doing what they're doing. And the psychology and the damage emotionally is enormous. But you know Rahab was one of the progenitors of David, who was one of the progenitors of 
Jesus himself. And Mary Magdalene says that she was closest to Jesus and that she was forgiven seven times and delivered from seven devils of invasion. And she also got the victory on hiring herself. Let's go to Eden and see how God might do this. How he might cause a person who has been involved in party time in their lifespan, skeletons in the closet. Jesus has stooped over a pile of dirt. What's he going to do? He's going to make him a man, as the old spiritual says. And the man he made is really something. He says he's more than twice as tall as men now living, 20 times the vital force, and 20 times the physical strength of men now living. Twice as tall, well, let's say 12 feet, let's say a little more, 13 feet. Such a man in proportion would weigh about a ton. Dynamic person, pure and clean and uncontaminated. Tell me, brothers and sisters, if he can do that with a pile of dirt, what can he do with you for whom he died? Can he restore damage, physical damage? Can he restore emotional damage? I will heal the broken in heart and bind up their wounds. Oh, yes, he can. Take courage, those of you who have been damaged in this area. Revelation, I mean, Jeremiah 30, 12 to 17. I'm just going to hit it. Just parts of verses. Verse 12 said, your bruise is incurable. And your wound is grievous. That is, you're going to die from this wound unless you get help. The next verse says, there is none to plead your cause. There's no attorney that will take your case. Because the attorney has the same disease. And all those that have loved you have forgotten you because of your situation. Now, God doesn't over-diagnose or he doesn't under-diagnose. He always hits it right on. And in the next verse, it says that we cry all the time. Our sorrow is constant because of our hopelessness. And in verse 17 is the great news. For I will restore health unto thee and will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. What do you say? Amen. He will heal those incurable wounds and bruises from which we're going to die. And he's the only one that can do it. And there's no other avenue to restoration and recovery from the abuse of this world than through he who made that pronouncement, the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you say? It's exactly right. And he says he will heal the incurable. Let's take him at his word. What do you say? Because the alternative isn't very bright. That's right. Is it? No. Supposing you got entangled in some business deals or you're in an economic downturn, as we all are in these days, Supposing you got yourself into things you wished you'd never gotten yourself into. What avenue can we take as Seventh-day Adventists that's not available anywhere else? Listen to this. Desire of Ages 329. Whatever you're worried about, it's called anxieties here. Whatever your anxieties and whatever your trials. I like the word whatever. What does that mean? Just bundle them up in a great big pile, impossibilities, possibilities, hopes, our own works, everything, just pile them into a pile, and whatever you're worried about, spread out your case before the Lord. This is step one. Step two said your spirit will be braced for endurance. Now this is immediate response. Your spirit will be braced for endurance. But we're not done. Listen to this. 
the way will be opened for you to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. What do you say? He's a God of the impossible. And if you're all entangled and you're in a mess and you don't know what to do, oh, you're in for a wonderful experience. Thank God for the impossibilities because when we begin to experience what he can do for us, it strengthens our faith and prepares us for the National Sunday Law, for the close of probation, to give the loud cry, to prepare for the shaking, to prepare for the time of Jacob's trouble. And there is no other avenue except to overcome the impossibilities. For it's the impossibilities that takes our hope. And it's the message of Jesus that says, I'll take the impossibilities, give them to me. Amen. You're at a point in your life where you've got to make a decision, you don't know what to do. This from page 668 of the same book. Those who decide to do nothing in any line that will displease God will know, not shall, not maybe, not I hope so, but will know after presenting their case before him just what course to pursue. He desires to restore you to himself and see his own purity restored in you. Whose purity? First John 3, 2, I love it, because when he comes, we're going to be like him for we shall see him as he is. And whatever skeletons you have in your closet, you're going to take advantage of the blank check from the university, universal bank of heaven that says, give me your impossibilities and I'll make you like the Son of God. For we're going to see him as he is. We're going to be like him, 1 John 3, 2. He desires to restore him, you to himself. He's lonely for you, brothers and sisters. He misses you. And without this fellowship with him, it is no good to prepare for the Sunday law. For you won't be ready, I promise. This thing is bigger than we can possibly imagine. And without him, side by side, in unity, with all reconciliations made and everything forgiven in heaven, we won't make it. And there is no other avenue than to take the avenue of impossibilities and see them pop like bubbles in the presence of the Holy Spirit, the angels, and the Lamb of God. Whatever the mistakes, and here's that word again, whatever, whatever your mistakes and failures of the past, we may, with the help of God, rise above them. Do you know what that means? That means that here's this big pile of difficulties, skeletons, bones, hurts, damages, that we're going to rise above them. That means they no longer have an effect on us. We are finished. Skeletons are gone. It's like Ephesians 3.17. It, well, during that period of 20 years after I was starting to play ball at 13, I was offered two professional contracts from Detroit and Pittsburgh. And I had three full rides to go to college. One of them was Oregon State University. A kid in bib overalls. Just because I could throw and sometimes people couldn't see it. All of these things opened up. But you know, there was a problem. Every college game was on what day? 
Well, now I'm driven by being a migrant farm worker and I had to get my family out of this to do something better for them. And so Sabbath kind of got trodden on. But I couldn't keep doing it. And after the first year, I quit. I went to Walla Walla, worked on the farm for 25 cents an hour shoveling calf pens. It was a bit of a demotion. And it looked like I was poor again, and it was a terrible, agonizing struggle for me. But you know, Elder Hubeck, the college church there, he had a week of prayer, and I stood and gave my heart to the Lord and requested rebaptism, and he did it. And it's like I just was an embrace experience with God, and I didn't want to let go. And he won't let you go as long as you want a hug. But pretty quick, he taps you on the shoulder. And he says, I got something I want to show you, Jerry. And here's people along a gate, piled up. They can't get through. It's too narrow. He says, will you help me help them get through the gate? Well, I didn't know that. 20 years old, what did I know? I thought I knew a lot, but came to me later, I didn't. <laughs> and this, Ephesians 3.17, I began to have an experience with God that was really special. And I gave him every room in my dwelling place, my heart, which Ephesians 3.17 mentions. I gave him the living room the social activities, gave him the kitchen, gave him the privacy of bedroom and bathroom, gave him the entertainment, gave him the books and the library, the den. I gave him every room in the house except one. It was upstairs. It's a closet. Had bars and chains on it. Do not enter. Skull and crossbones on the outside of it. And every morning Jesus met me as he promised to do in Isaiah 50 verse 4. Morning by morning he'll give me the tongue of the learned that I will know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. And I had that experience every morning. One morning he came and he went right upstairs and stood in front of that closet. Oh boy, I didn't want him to go in there, but he asked to go in there, and I said very eloquently, uh-uh, no, come down the stairs and left. Next morning, same thing. Next morning for several days, same thing, up to that stupid old unfumigated skeleton-lined putrefying flesh closet. And then he didn't come at all. So I had a plan. I'm taking every office that the church will give me, elder, part-time deacon, anything. And at work, I got all the overtime. And when I get home, I turn up the stereo, I turn on the TV, I make as much noise as I can, and while I'm doing all that, I'm talking on the phone. I'm jamming everything so that I can't think about what's in that closet, reserved, protected, pridefully for myself. And you know, I couldn't sleep, so I started taking little things to make you sleep. I don't remember the name of them now, but it's supposed to help you sleep. And just about ready to do something illegal, including alcohol, when I fell on my knees and said, Lord, I need help. And as my introduction said very eloquently by our pastor, I was rescued. And you know, Brothers and sisters, uh, he was there immediately. Let me tell you how he, I knew he was there. 
Peter's walking on the water and he started to sink. How long would it take for him to get above his nose if you were walking on water? Not very long. But down he went and he says, Lord, save me. And immediately the Lord put forth his hand. There are prayers, brothers and sisters, that are always answered now. And one of them is your rescue. If you're in a situation where you need help, Lord, help me, is the prayer of choice. And immediately the Lord put forth his hand, save Peter. And immediately I could sense the Lord was beside me, and he says, uh, may I go up and take care of the closet? Right back to the closet issue again. I said, okay. And on the way up, you know, he said something rather surprising. He says, you know, Jerry, I know what's in there. It's kind of a shock to me. I went in and cleaned it all out. Has his own way of fumigating things to make it more beautiful than it was ever been. Put down, put his arm around his shoulder and he says, I've got a couple of things that I'd like for you to do for me. Would you do it? Or whatever you say, Lord. He says, if you've sinned against the church, I want you to come right up here and say, Church, I'm sorry for what I did. Please forgive me. If you have hurt somebody in the audience, I want you to go to them alone, as in Matthew 18, 15, and say to them, I'm sorry. And if you have sinned by thoughts, you take it to God alone. For contrary to a very strong popular religion today, no one cometh to the Father but what? But by me. This is not a church detour. Right straight to God. Amen. And I said, yes, sir, I will. And I'll be with you always, he said. It's sort of like he put his hand on my life and touched me like an old violin. It was battered and scarred and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth the while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar? A dollar, then two, only two? Two dollars, who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice. Going for three, but... No. In the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. And wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as an angel sings. Music ceased. The auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, What am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with a bow. Thousand dollars, who'll make it two? Two thousand, who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them cried, we don't quite understand. What changed its worth? Swift came the reply. T'was the touch of the master's hand. And many a soul with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game 
and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, going and almost gone. The master comes and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. To be aware of new videos like this one, be sure to subscribe to the Preparing for the Time of Trouble channel. For more free videos and downloadable audio podcasts, as well as handouts, go to www.preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com. Topic categories include recordings of live seminar presentations, country living, sustainable gardening, homestead remedies, how to be self-sufficient when the grid goes down, wild edible and medicinal plants, hydrotherapy, and end-time Bible prophecies. To take advantage of these free resources, go to preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com.